Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Global Agenda at the University of Delaware. I'm Ralph Begleiter, the director of the Center for Political Communication. Global Agenda is supported by the University of Delaware's Institute for Global Studies, the Department of Political Science and International Relations, and the Department of Communication. There are lots of places in the world where the influence of the United States is felt, but I think it's fair that there is no other place where the U.S. role is more pervasive, more controversial, or more in demand than the Middle East. Just think of this. Decade after decade after decade in the Middle East, the United States has organized peace talks among Arabs and Israelis, has imposed sanctions on countries like Iran and Libya, has funneled in billions of dollars in military and economic aid, more than to any other region of the world, and has extracted billions and billions of dollars worth of energy resources, all in one region, all in the Middle East. And that doesn't even count the several wars the U.S. has waged, supplied, opposed, or cheered on in the region. Nor does it count the many leaders in the region the U.S. has supported or opposed, overtly or covertly. Nor does it account for the many times Americans have been held hostage, kidnapped, blown up, or otherwise terrorized in the Middle East. So I think it's appropriate that our first regional look at America's role in the world this year is the Middle East. Our speaker tonight is from Lebanon and Jordan, two of Israel and Syria's direct neighbors. Jordan has a peace treaty with Israel and is aiding the rebels fighting in Syria's dictatorship, fighting against Syria's dictatorship. Lebanon doesn't have a peace treaty with Israel, not because the Lebanese people don't want it, but because Syria's political and military pressure on Lebanon has consistently blocked such an agreement. Although technically Lebanon is at peace with Syria, there are many Lebanese who are rooting for the overthrow of the Syrian regime. Our speaker tonight, Rami Huri, is a Palestinian who also has family roots in the biblical West Bank town of Nazareth. For many years, he led the Beirut Daily Star newspaper and is still its editor at large. It's a paper widely read throughout the Arab world, and Rami's columns and his observations on the Middle East might be familiar to many of you who've seen him for years on American television, on the BBC, in news magazines and newspapers throughout the West. Mr. Huri is a graduate in political science and communication of Syracuse University, but we won't hold that against him. <laughs> and the only reason Rami is here tonight with us is that the Orange Men are not playing tonight in the Big East Tournament, because they played and won this afternoon. By the way, Rami has asked if it's okay uh, to speak uh, briefly from the podium here, and then we'll sit down together for the rest of the conversation. I'm sure you'll all agree that's fine. Please welcome Rami Huri to the University of Delaware. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you all for uh, inviting me back and for uh, coming out. Uh, we uh, watched the first half of the Syracuse Seton Hall game, and it was a blessed experience. <laughs> Syracuse won, but in the spirit of uh, ecumenical love and cross-cultural understanding, to all of you from New Jersey, I say tough bananas. <laughs> and we will play Pittsburgh tomorrow night. Uh, other than that, we are all one family, and uh, we have many things to share in, in the human experience and in the political and cultural realm and religious and secular and socioeconomic and many different fields that, uh, and security and other things that sometimes bring us together and sometimes push us apart. But I'd like to talk tonight uh, about the U.S. role in the Middle East and Ralph has asked me to address that issue. I've uh, known Ralph for I guess around 35 years, 30 years, something like that, and, uh, and uh, he and I go back a long way, and we've learned a lot of things together, and we agree on most everything, but there's still a couple of things that we disagree on, but we talk about them, and, and it's part of the uh, great uh, satisfying uh, 
experience of not only Arab life and American life, uh, but also university life, that you can talk about the issues you disagree about, and especially if it's over a nice meal, and you can understand each other better and, uh, and move on to help, we hope, make a better world. So I thank you, Ralph, for uh, inviting me and uh, maintaining our friendship over all these years. <clears throat> the, uh, the issue of the U.S., the role in the Middle East, and the perceptions of the U.S. in the Middle East and the perceptions of the Middle East in, uh, in the United States uh, is, is extremely important and timely. Uh, but it's also incredibly complicated and, and gets more complicated every year. Um, this is a moment of uh, immense uh, historic change and some danger and much opportunity uh, in the Middle East and in the relationship between the people of the Middle East and the United States people and government. It also deals with other people and governments around the world, but I'm just addressing the American Middle Eastern relationship uh, tonight. And if we talk about change and danger and opportunity, I think we really need to separate those three things to really understand the fundamental drivers of what is uh, going on, uh, why we have the trends that we have now, uh, and what is it that is possibly important, and, and what are the opportunities that actually are there for us to seize. I think we have to start, uh, the, we have to start with an analysis that values equally and simultaneously the interests of the people, of the different people of the Middle East and the United States and others, I said, but I'm talking about the U.S. and the Middle East. We have to look at both of these groups of people as uh, children of God, uh, human beings with civil and political and national rights, and people who collectively and individually have the same rights, and those rights must be implemented simultaneously, not sequentially, that, it, that we don't guarantee the interests of one group before the interests of another group are taken into consideration. So I think that's the starting point of my analysis, and I think it's one that I encourage others to address, especially when you get into contentious issues like, say, the U.S.-Iranian tensions these days. If you don't assume that both parties have equal and simultaneous rights, uh, then you're probably not going to get uh, very far. If you start with the assumption that one person's, one side's rights have to be implemented first, then you're almost certainly guaranteed uh, to, to fail. In that context, I would say that we have uh, two uh, overriding realities that define the American Middle Eastern relationships. Uh, one is that there are so many historic and deep issues at hand that have to be addressed, and I'll mention them, but there's a multitude of issues. This isn't a one-issue situation. Years ago, it was essentially a three-issue situation. When you looked at the U.S. and the Middle East, Arab-Israeli conflict, the Cold War, I can see many of you are old enough to remember the Cold War, and, uh, and, the, uh, and, and uh, energy, uh, oil and, and energy access. Those were the three issues that defined the U.S. and the Middle East for many, many years. Today, there's many, many more issues. The second point <coughs> is the fast-changing posture of the United States in the Middle East or throughout the Middle East. This is not a static situation where we can say that the U.S. is on good terms with some people, not good terms with other people, uh, or the people, the citizens of some countries like the U.S., but the governments of some countries don't. Every dimension of the relationship between the United States and the people and governments of the Middle East, the Arab countries, Israel, Iran, and Turkey are the main ones I'm talking about, every dimension of those relationships is evolving constantly. Uh, and therefore, it makes it pretty difficult to try to get a handle on this issue. But let me list for you what I think are the issues at play here, uh, and then we'll analyze what's going on. Energy is the oldest and maybe the easiest. 
because the flow of energy is, is going to go on. The people who have the energy, oil and gas, are going to sell it. They're not going to hoard it or anything. So energy is there, and maybe the easiest issue. Second is the Arab-Israeli conflict. The Arab-Israeli conflict has been going on for about 65 years uh, in its current form, where you have the state of Israel and Arab countries and Palestinians who are in conflict. Um, and it is the most radicalizing and destabilizing uh, uh, issue in the region, I think, has been and continues to be. The third issue is uh, Iran and its relationships with various actors. Iran and Arab countries, Iran and Israel, Iran and the United States, multiple relationships. And multiple dimensions of that relationship, security, nuclear power, uh, religious issues, and others. The fourth issue is the current Arab uprisings and transformations that are going on all over the region, have been going on for just over two years now. And the Syria war is the most uh, complicated part of that process right now. But these transformations are not just transforming the countries or some countries of the region and slowly, slowly move them towards more pluralistic democracies, we hope. I, I think that will happen. But it's a slow and difficult process. But those transformations are also recalibrating relationships among Arabs and Israelis, among Arabs and Iranians, among Arabs and Americans, and, and many others. The, f the fourth issue is the fifth issue are the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, both of which are winding down, uh, but continue to have huge repercussions and reverberations all around the region. The sixth issue are the, is the range of new actors that are now involved in the Middle Eastern arena and directly or indirectly with American Middle Eastern relations. I'm talking about Turkey, China, Russia. Russia is not new, but a revived Russian role, especially when you see Syria. Uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council countries, especially Saudi Arabia and Qatar. The role of the Arab League. Um, and the uh, multiple forms of political and social movements manifested in uh, what we call Islamist groups, the Muslim Brotherhood types, and some of the more militant Salafist, and, and then the very few small terrorist groups that are involved in military uh, work. But the mainstream nonviolent uh, Muslim Brotherhood type groups are now uh, elected democratically, the president of Egypt, the leading member of the coalition in Tunisia, are Islamist groups, Muslim Brotherhood types, and they represent something incredibly new and important in the region, which is constantly evolving. The seventh issue is the issue of terrorism and weapons pr proliferation. And when you look at uh, uh, Mali and, and Yemen and Somalia and um, Syria and other places, you see the ramifications of the combination of uh, terrorism issues, as well as weapons proliferation in the arms of new groups and in context of unstable uh, societies in some cases. The eighth point is the growing fragility, weakness, and in some cases collapse of some of the countries in the region. Um, Somalia, Yemen uh, are two dramatic examples. Sudan. Uh, split into two countries peacefully through a referendum and an agreement. Um, you have uh, Syria now moving in a direction which nobody can predict. Uh, Iraq is very fragile. Uh, Egypt is, uh, is quite fra fragile, but Egypt will probably hold together, I think. But still, you have this new phenomenon of countries that used to be very tightly centrally controlled authoritarian systems which were very predictable for five or six decades and suddenly are no longer predictable or tightly controlled or authoritarian. Some of them are turning into democracies. Some of them are in a process towards that goal. And some of them are uh, falling apart and, and, and may collapse as, as countries we don't know. The ninth point is the uh, ideological Cold War within the Middle East. <clears throat> 
which has several different uh, parameters. Uh, you have Iranians and Arabs. You have uh, Islamic Islamists and secular groups. You have monarchies and republics. You have uh, Sunnis and Shiites. You have uh, different combinations of these ideologies and identities that compete with each other across the region in different ways. And some of them come together. The uh, Iranians, uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, Syria, one or two others have worked together for some years, um, creating what they call a resistance and deterrence front. And other people have been working against them. In, uh, Within the Middle East, some of the conservative monarchies like Saudi Arabia and, and Jordan. Uh, so there's, there's a regional cold war, an ideological cold war, in which the antagonists are uh, facing each other and competing with each other in many arenas, in Lebanon and Palestine, with, between Hamas and Fatah, in Lebanon, between the two groups in Lebanon, in Yemen, in Somalia, in Iraq, uh, Virtually everywhere around the region, you have these confrontations taking place. And this uh, emerging ideological Cold War is heavily focused on Arabs and Iranians and their uh, various allies, but also the Turks and the Israelis at some point will be more involved, directly or indirectly. And finally, the tenth point is we're dealing with a Middle East in which there are enormous powerful and unpredictable forces of individual empowerment through the two greatest forces to hit the region, I think, in several generations. One is the unbridled power of social media and digital communications, and the other is the more powerful unbridled power of mass street politics, of hundreds of thousands of people on the street forcing political changes. The single most important thing that has happened in this region in the last few years is this concept of street politics, where I would say several hundred million people, maybe 200 million out of the 350 million Arabs, have supported these street revolutions that want to bring about new forms of government that are more accountable, more democratic, more participatory, more pluralistic, and hopefully we'll get there. We're not there yet. But the single most important element of this process is there is a new foundation of populist legitimacy that is the reference point for the legitimacy of political power and authority. The reference point for legitimacy of political power and authority for the last three generations, since the 1950s, has been who was the army supporting. In Egypt, the army ran the country for six decades, from 1952. And in most of the Arab countries, the army or the mukhabarat, the intelligence agencies, or the police, as in Tunisia, some element of the security forces essentially ran the country. They provided political legitimacy because they were the ones who defined who was in power. There is a new reference point, which is populist legitimacy. But it has not yet solidified. It has not yet clarified the mechanisms by which Populist sentiments allow a majority of the people to bestow legitimacy and incumbency on a ruling government. Elections are one way, referendums are another way, writing constitutions is another way, street demonstrations is another way. All of these are happening now, judicial uh, um, challenges. All of these things are going on now in places like Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt. And all of these processes have brought about movement in, in so many of these uh, issues that I mentioned that define the Middle East. And if you look at all of these issues, in, in every single one of them, except possibly for uh, the first one, energy, in every single one of these issues, I would argue that the United States policy over the, la over the last two generations, say in the last 50 years or so, has made direct and major contributions to the complexity of these conditions, to the birth 
of some of these new problems and to the, condition, to the continuing conditions of tension and conflict that we see. It's not the fault of the United States that we have so many of these problems, but the United States direct and indirect involvement militarily, economically, with uh, political, military, financial support has had been a strong contributing factor to every one of these issues uh, that I mentioned. So when President Obama goes to the Middle East, John Kerry just came back a few days ago, he, he's going, the president is going to a, a completely new world. He has to throw away everything that people in the United States have told him about the Middle East until about a year ago. He's faced with completely new conditions, new actors, new forms of legitimacy, new mechanisms of accountability, new configurations of pluralism and, and self-expression, and most importantly, uh, a new balance among the populist legitimacy, which is a majority rule and minority protection of minority rights anchored in the consent of the governed, combined with civilian control over military rule, which is, for instance, what has happened in Turkey in the last 30 years, and it's one of the reasons why Turkey has been so impressive in this development. We're seeing some of these new realities slowly, slowly taking root in the Arab world, and the United States needs to make a fundamental structural reassessment of whether it will continue the patterns of the past two generations uh, in supporting autocrats in playing footsies with military rulers and persisting in a, in a bias towards Israel rather than being fully even-handed in the Arab-Israeli conflict, in confronting countries like Iran with a combination of uh, threats and sanctions without fully engaging in a diplomatic give and take, in sending its armies uh, to attack countries and in many cases, in retrospect, under false pretense, as was the case in Iraq, or in engaging in what it does now in uh, uh, routine assassinations with drones, in some cases killing innocent civilians, but in all cases uh, killing people without any public justification, any mechanisms of uh, the rights of the accused that shape and define American cultural and political values. And, and I understand the need to protect the United States from security threats, but the power of the United States and the reason people look to the United States and want to come here is because it has mechanisms anchored in the rule of law to deal with security threats and to deal with um, um, people who are troublemakers, whether in your society or in other societies. So the United States has to reassess, I think, all of these uh, issues and to uh, look around the Middle East and understand how, what is the best mechanism? How can the United States engage with this current historic transformation that's going on? The most significant mass change in the Middle East, I, I would say, since the advent of statehood in the 50s and 40s and 50s and 60s, the, the people of the Middle East are in, the people of the Arab world by and large, are involved in the first ever process of mass self-determination. We are living in an extraordinarily exciting era in which millions of Arab citizens, directly or indirectly, are writing their own constitutions. It's never happened before. We've never had a process of self-determination in which the citizens of these countries define their constitutions, express their national values, shape their national institutions, and configure the exercise of power in a manner that responds both to their cultural and religious and civic identities and national sentiments, whether they're Arabs or whether they're, they see themselves as members of tribes or they see themselves as religiously motivated or members of only one country or pan-Arab followers, whatever they feel themselves to be. Millions of Arabs have the chance now, which they've never had before, to write their own constitutions and to tell us exactly who they are and what they believe and what they hold dear. And what I think is going on 
is that for the first time in my life, certainly, we see an extraordinary window for the rhetoric and the values and the interests, the rhetoric, the values, and the interests of the United States and of the 350 million Arabs to come together in a historic synthesis of values that we believe can be traced back several thousand years in the Arab world, several thousand years, the values, values of freedom, of pluralism, of the rule of law. And I just would remind you that the first documented use of the word freedom in modern history uh, was in the ancient, uh, uh, in the ancient Mesopotamian, uh, in an ancient Mesopotamian site from around uh, 1200 BC. Uh, in the Mesopotamian record now in uh, Iraq and, uh, and Syria, the first time the word freedom was documented in human history was in our region. It may have meant something different than what people use it to, to mean today. It was in the city-state of Lagash, if any of you are interested to look it up on the historical record. And it's the combination of those ancient values that we feel permeate our societies through tribal traditions, through civic consciousness, through religious values, most recently expressed in uh, Islamic form, but previously in uh, Christian and Jewish uh, theology and doctrine. Uh, the Abrahamic traditions of mercy, of love, of equality, of faith. And to combine those with the modern manifestations of the doctrines of free citizens, equal under God and under the rule of law, articulated in a constitution and protected by a political system in which the majority rules and the minority is protected. This is the first time that we can dare to even start thinking about these great American traditions which came into being with a big bang in the 18th century, in some cases right around here in the early years of your revolution and your constitu constitutional history, and in ancient times and modern times have been expressed in different forms by different people in the Arab world, and now have reached for the first time ever a point where millions of ordinary Arabs are giving life and political expression and legal force to these values and interests. The challenge for the United States and the challenge for the people and leaderships of the Arab world are to grasp how important and how fleeting this opportunity is. We've had many opportunities in in, in my lifetime, for Arab-Israeli peace, for movements of democratic change, for movements of human rights in the Arab world, for movements of Arab and American understanding and convergence of interests, but we've missed every one of them. For faults that are anchored in the United States and anchored in the Arab world equally. The difference between us, though, is that we don't send our armies to the United States. The United States sends its armies to the Middle East. We don't support regimes in the United States. The United States for 60 years has supported autocratic Arab regimes and, and worked hard to keep them in place, and in some cases to overthrow ones they don't like and put ones, new ones in place. The US is a dynamic, active power in the Arab world in a way that the Arab world is not in the United States. So I would say that there is a equal burden on both of us to understand the possibilities at hand, but the United States has a much more realistic opportunity to translate this opportunity into, uh, into fact, into political uh, reality. The situation, as, a, as President Obama heads to the Middle East next week, is not encouraging for the United States. The, a recent poll that just came out yesterday by the Gallup organization, an American uh, group, uh, shows that the approval rating of the American government's 
performance around the world has declined, has continued to decline in recent years. It's now down to about, uh, across 30 countries that were studied by Gallup, the approval rating of the United States was 41%, as opposed to 49% uh, three years ago. So it's continuing uh, to go down. It's interesting that the approval rating is very high in a country like Libya. Libyans approve of the United States. It's 54%. Uh, but it's very low in countries like uh, um, North Africa. It's 30%. And the reason, I think, is very the other countries in North Africa, Tunis and Egypt and others. And the reason, I think, is very simple. The United States was actively involved through NATO in helping to get rid of the Gaddafi regime, which the majority of Libyans started to do themselves, and then the U.S. came to their support. It was one of the rare examples where the United States put its army where its mouth is. It put its military force in the service of populist legitimacy and a transition from authoritarianism to pluralistic democratic aspirations as defined and initiated by the Arab people in the country of Libya. In Egypt and Tunisia and other places, and Syria and other places, the U.S. hasn't been as forthcoming, and therefore you have much varied responses, much varied perceptions of the U.S. among people uh, across uh, the Arab world. And it's not just the Arab world. In Europe, for instance, the approval rating um, has gone down in the last three years from 42 to 36 percent on average. Um, and the highest disapproval, not surprisingly, 75% disapprove of U.S. policy in Pakistan and Palestine. It's very obvious that people are reacting to what the United States does in its foreign policy. When the United States conducts a foreign policy that reflects the values of its own society and brings together the shared interests of the American government and people, and the people of those countries abroad, there is great congruity and shared positive feelings uh, about uh, the other. So I think, the, and I'll finish by, because uh, we'll have to leave more time for questions and answers where I can also learn from your questions and your views. I finish by saying that what distinguishes the United States in the world since the creation of the United States in the late 18th century are two things. The, na the nature of the concept of a democratic pluralistic republic anchored in citizens' equal rights and the implementation of that using the rule of law. You started your career as a country with a shining democracy in which only white men who had slaves and land had any rights. Nobody else had any rights. Women, blacks, you know, very few people had rights. But you overcame those early distortions. And that is a testament to your putting into practice those values that you articulated in rhetoric and in incredibly moving documents. If you haven't been to the new Constitution Center in Philadelphia, you should go there. It's a very powerful, moving story. What makes it so powerful is that it's a never-ending story. The constant reassessment, reconfiguration, refinement, and re-legitimization of the concept of a people's republic anchored in equal rights for all citizens, guaranteed by the rule of law, ultimately guaranteed by an independent judiciary and the balance of forces among the different elements of government is constantly renewed year after year after year. This is what many people in the Arab world are trying to do. But many people have still the perceptions. Ralph asked me to talk about the perceptions of the US and the Middle East. The perceptions remain extremely mixed. When the United States only erratically applies these same concepts in its foreign policy, the reaction is what you get in the Gallup poll of yesterday, that people disapprove of the United States. And what that results in is the United States losing respect and losing impact around the region. In the last 
five years or so, six years, the United States has tried in various ways to pressure the Israeli government on settlements, to pressure the Arab governments on peace with Israel, to pressure the Iranian government on nuclear stuff, and to pressure the Turkish government on a bunch of things, including the Iraq war in 2003. On all four counts, when the United States tried to pressure and cajole and influence the four great actors of the Middle East, Iran, Israel, Turkey, and the Arab world, nobody responded. All four of them pushed back. Why? Because they neither respected the American approach, they didn't think it was credible, nor did they fear American threats. And if you look at Iran, you see the best example, and we can talk about that in the, in the Q&A. So the American government losing respect overseas because of the erratic nature of its application and practice of its principles at home that are so valued and so admired, the implications of that are quite serious when it comes to actual uh, policy uh, and foreign policy uh, issues. But I think this, we need to go beyond, uh, I could have said that 10 years ago, and I did many times, but uh, we have to get beyond uh, analyzing what went wrong, and, and I could make a whole list of things that the Arab countries have done wrong, but the fact is the Arab countries are now finally in a, in a position of, in a situation of slow change, and it's more important for us, I believe, to try to understand the entry points to the linkages between American rhetoric, American interests, and American values, and those same interests and values and rhetoric on the Arab side. And the entry point is very simple, uh, that all human beings uh, were created, were in, endowed by the divine creator with inalienable rights of citizenship, of freedom, of equality, of dignity. And the United States put that uh, fine rhetoric into practice. The Arabs are starting to try to put that fine rhetoric into practice and have paid Tens of thousands of people have paid for their lives with this. What we want from the United States now is to go beyond the rhetoric, certainly beyond Obama's rhetoric of the last three or four years, which was sparkling in its eloquence. But as you can see from the results of the standing of the US in the region, uh, the more eloquent he is in his rhetoric, the less respect that people have for the United States because the rhetoric doesn't get matched with with policy changes. So this is the great opportunity we have. Where is the entry point? And it's, it's, the, it's the process of transformation towards democratization and governance by the rule of law that protects all citizens. But the rule of law is not only an, an indigenous domestic issue. The rule of law also means that if we apply certain standards of behavior to uh, Iranian actions, we need to apply them to Israeli actions. If having nuclear bombs is not allowed in one country by law or morality, then how can we let it be in another country? If applying UN resolutions in one country is allowed to be ignored, then how can you try to implement UN resolutions in another country? So the real challenge for the United States and the real challenge for the people of the Arab world is to, to come together to discuss the application of a single standard of law and morality for all of the parties concerned. This means tough decisions in the Arab world about coming to terms with the reality of Israel within the confines of UN resolutions and international law on refugeehood, on statehood, on occupation, on colonization, and all of the other actions that the Arabs raise. And we need to come to terms with the reality of Israel within its 67 border to live in security and acceptance. The Israelis need to do exactly the same for the Palestinians and the Arabs. We have to look at Iran's issue. We have to look at uh, the issue of human rights across the region, which people in the Arab countries are doing, in the Gulf countries, in Egypt, and Jordan, and Morocco, and Turkey, and anywhere you want. It's a little bit romantic. But romanticism was born in this country in the 1770s. And romanticism was translated into reality. And this is our great opportunity. I hope that we grasp it. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Rami. I'm not going to give you much time to breathe here, so uh, I want to follow up on a couple of things from your remarks, and then we'll, we'll take questions from our audience. <clears throat> you talked in your remarks just now about the Libya situation, and you pointed out that the U.S. respect among Libyans for, or respect for the U.S. among Libyans has gone up as a result of the U.S. action there. And although you didn't mention it here, you did a little while ago over dinner with our students that you thought the United States should be taking a more active role in the Syrian uprising that's going on now. What would be your policy recommendation for President Obama right now about what to do with Syria? Should the U.S. be arming the Syrian rebels? Should the U.S. be intervening itself militarily? Should the U.S. be encouraging military intervention as you praised in Libya? Or is there some other option? I have to get out my prayer beads for this one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this one's for you, Tom Charles. <laughs> um, there's a great old American political expression that I learned in graduate school. You either cook or get out of the kitchen. And what I mean by that is the U.S. has been very forceful in its support for the rebels and for overthrowing Assad and has provided some humanitarian aid and, and refugee aid and stuff like that. But the real need now for the rebels as they have started, as the, the peaceful demonstrations that started two years ago, in fact, exactly, I think it was exactly today, March 13. And I was in Damascus that day, March 13, 2011, when this started. I was there for a conference. And uh, the uh, rebellion that started as mass peaceful demonstrations, then about a year later became an armed civil war or an armed conflict. And in this armed conflict, the rebels and, and the people resisting Assad rule are, are making a heroic effort and paying with a huge number of their lives and thousands imprisoned and tortured, etc. So it's not as if the U.S. started this. It's the Syrian people who have started this, and they're willing to pay the price. And they just need some more assistance on the military side. Uh, and the U.S. should give them the military assistance they need. It's, I, I wouldn't say the U.S. should start this process and go to a country and give people military aid to overthrow the government. But in this case, the Syrian rebels, the people started this, and a little bit of more military aid. They're getting aid. The rebels are getting aid already. They just need a little bit more sophisticated stuff, especially anti-aircraft missiles and some communications and satellites, stuff like that. Um, and uh, the, the regime would fall, I think, very quickly. The other side of that is by doing, by maintaining its policy now, the U.S. government is saying we can't risk giving sophisticated like Stinger missiles and anti-aircraft missiles. We can't give these to the rebels because they might fall into the hands of the Islamist rebels. And these are bad guys and we don't like them and some of them are maybe close to Al-Qaeda and some of them we don't know what they are. And we can't risk helping these Islamic rebels become stronger. But the irony is, because the US and others in the West withhold these sophisticated weapons from the rebels, the Islamist rebels are getting their arms from many places, funded by wealthy people in the Gulf. So the exact thing that the US wants to prevent, which is the strengthening of the Islamic rebels, is happening because the US is doing what it's doing. The US and other Western, to be fair, so the Islamic rebels are getting stronger. They're militarily more effective. They are generating political support in the country more and more. They are starting to run governing councils in different parts of Syria. Uh, and in the meantime, the mainstream uh, rebels are still making gains, but at a much slower uh, pace. So my uh, argument is if the United States is really serious about what it's saying, if its rhetoric is true that it wants to get rid of Assad, and supports the Syrian people, give them the arms uh, they need. And, and you, it will be a huge uh, benefit after the government falls, because Syrians will be deeply indebted to the United States, like the Libyan people are today. And taking the typical journalist's tack of going to the extreme here to get you to uh, go farther in this policy, if the US decided tomorrow to start giving heavy weaponry Stinger missiles. Last time we did that by the United States, we gave Stinger missiles to people fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan, found them being used against the United States later on. Um, 
do you think all the other countries of the Arab world would stand up and cheer if the United States started heavily arming the overthrow of the Syrian regime? Would the Bahrain leadership, for example, like the idea of the U.S. sending weapons to rebels? A few countries. What about the Saudis? A few, well, the Saudis are giving money and arms to the rebels already. Themselves. They're Saudi government and Saudi private uh, financiers. The Arab League has taken a decision to, uh, and the Arab League is the representatives of the Arab governments. The Arab League, a couple of weeks ago, took a decision to recognize the uh, rebels, or the Syrian National Coalition and Resistance Front, as the sole legitimate representative of the Syrian government. And they've emptied the Syrian seat at the Arab League, and they're waiting for the rebels, for the coalition to create a government in exile, which they should do in the next couple of weeks. They're meeting now in Istanbul and Cairo. And once that government in exile is elected or chosen, they will have the official Syrian seat at the Arab League. So there's a lot of support in the Arab world, not unanimous, but a lot of support to help the Syrian people and rebels overthrow their government. The problem you mentioned of the Afghanistan is absolutely uh, correct, because back then, these movements, and including bin Laden, uh, and these small movements of uh, Afghani and Arab uh, resistance fighters, who, who were there to fight the Soviets, uh, because they saw the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan as an encroachment on Islamic land. And they saw themselves fighting a defensive jihad to protect the lands of Islam from foreign invaders. And the U.S. was helping some of them directly or indirectly, um, but it clearly didn't know what it was doing and didn't know these people very well. But to be fair, nobody knew these people very well. They were new. They were, uh, nobody knew how serious they were. So there was a bit of incompetence, I think, in spreading the weapons. I think the groups in Syria who are a part of the Syrian, uh, the Free Army and the uh, uh, Syrian National Council and the Syrian National Resistance Coalition, these are well-known groups. They're well known. They've been working for two years. The Turks, the Qataris, the Saudis, the Jordanians, they know these people very well. Um, and probably half of these groups are infiltrated by Jordanian and Turkish and Saudi intelligence, as happens in most of these cases. So I think the chances of arms falling into the wrong hands are much, much less in this case. And do you think the United States should have done that in Egypt as well? Should the US have intervened in the Egyptian Arab Spring militarily? to uh, dissuade the Egyptian military from doing what it did and from supporting the then regime of Egypt? No, in Egypt there was no need for military uh, intervention. The US was a bit slow in Tunisia and Egypt uh, coming to terms with uh, the realities of these popular demonstrations and the fragility and then the overthrow of these governments. The US was kind of uh, slightly shaky and, and imprecise and unclear. Uh, and to be fair, again, to the United States government, this was a whole new world. I mean, nobody had ever seen this. Hundreds of thousands of people overthrowing uh, uh, the regime of, of Egypt and Tunisia, who were seen to be uh, not only two of the most uh, 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 durable police states in the Arab world, but go back to 2006, 2008, 2010, Tunisia and Egypt were the two poster children of economic development. The World Bank and USAID and the US government and the IMF were pointing to Tunisia and Egypt as the great success stories of economic development, six or seven percent growth every year, uh, and suddenly they were overthrown by their own people. So there was huge uh, lack of clarity and understanding um, among the American government, but also other governments in the Western world about why is it that these two countries that were growing 7% a year economically suddenly had these popular revolutions. Uh, so there wasn't, it wasn't clear to the US uh, what was happening and what it should do. L Libya was much more clear. Libya, there was a, an imminent threat of a massive government, a Gaddafi government military move against Benghazi. And, uh, and I think this was one of the most important uh, examples and one of the few examples where the world put into, in a, into practice the doctrine called the responsibility to protect. Uh, that if governments do not protect their own civilians, then the rest of the world should step in and do something. And this was something that came out of the Rwanda and Burundi and before in Kosovo and before that. The difference in Libya uh, or not the difference, but what happened in Libya is that the Arab League, the Libyan people, and the UN Security Council all sanctioned that process. So it had huge legitimacy. 
uh, in Egypt and uh, Tunis, there was no demand for external military uh, aid. Um, you, uh, you're here in an audience of University of Delaware students and other Delawareans who are interested in this topic, but I'm going to ask you to make the case to a broader American audience about why the United States should be intervening militarily now in Syria's revolution. I don't know if intervening militarily is the right word. I think the U.S. should provide Providing arms is not intervening well, militarily? Well, it's, 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 yes, it's, I mean, they're not getting involved in the fighting directly, but they're, they're already providing aid, they're providing money, they're providing uh, some non-lethal stuff, which you could argue is helping the soldiers and whatever, but I think maybe it is, I don't see it as a direct military involvement. I see it as a, uh, as, as participating with others in a, in a process that the Syrians launched and defined and, and, and navigate themselves. Uh, nobody's asking the U.S. to go in there and send troops and, uh, and fly airplanes. That might happen. If, if, if three, four hundred Syrians are killed every day, which is possible, uh, there may be calls for a safety zone, a no-fly zone in the north. It's possible. And then people might ask for a Libya-type NATO intervention. Uh, in which the uh, army and the air force might get involved. I don't think that's going to happen. But I see this as a as a as a very clearly defined, limited uh, form of uh, assistance, participation, um, but not direct involvement of Americans in the by fighting. And what's the political case here in the United States that President Obama could come back from the Middle East, make a speech in the U.S that would persuade Americans that this is the right step for the United States to be taking right now? Uh, the spirit of 1776 is alive and kicking along the Orontes River. The people of Syria are fighting and dying for their liberty, for their dignity, for their freedom, for their democracy. They have initiated this fight. They have paid the price. They are willing to see it through. They need assistance. The United States rhetorically says it supports them, it's time for the United States to put its uh, policy where its mouth is and provide assistance in a legitimate context, which is legitimized by the Arab League, which it is, by a clear majority of the Syrian people, which it is. It's not going to be legitimized by the Security Council because the Russians have a veto. Uh, and therefore, the United States needs to work on a more on finding a legitimate global context that would add a new layer of legitimacy. But the legitimacy factor is very important. So this is not seen as an American move. And it cannot be solely an American move. The British are just ready now to start giving military aid. You'll, in the next week or two, you'll probably see British uh, stuff flowing to the Syrian uh, rebels. And others are going to do the same. So in the long-term interest, this is good for American credibility. It's good for Syrian democratic transition. It strengthens the mainstream, uh, secular, non-Islamist, non-radical opposition. It earns gratitude among the vast majority of Arabs and, uh, and Syrians. It's not a direct American involvement. It doesn't risk American lives. There's a strong case to be made if the United States is actually serious about what it's saying. And the sad fact is that most of the people in the Arab world are not sure that the United States is really serious because the United States has talked about supporting democratic transitions in the Arab world, but has not done anything about them. And in some cases where in Bahrain, for instance, the Saudi government and others moved in and quashed the uprising, it's still going on in Bahrain every day, but the United States seems peculiarly quiet uh, about that. Now, you can argue that this is not an absolute world of, of absolute uh, right and wrong, that there are interests, and the interests of keeping the Persian uh, Arab Gulf region stable and uh, quiet uh, maybe uh, overrides the interest to support democratic transitions and constitutional king, uh, uh, monarchy in, in Bahrain. The counter argument to that is that the United States has made that argument for the last 60 years and realized that it was a stupid argument, that you don't provide stability with, through military force. You provide stability through the consent of the governed and the sense of your own people that they live in a land that respects their rights as citizens and provides equal rights to all, uh, all people. And this is what the Bahraini opposition is fighting for, equal rights, non-discrimination. Uh, and the United States should, uh, uh, should uh, get onto that uh, road and uh, get, uh, make it clear that it supports equal rights and democratic transitions uh, for everybody. Uh, and and if it, even if it happens to uh, 
some countries like uh, Bahrain, if this is uh, the will of the majority of people and if it's a peaceful process and they're asking for their human rights and their constitutional uh, equal rights, they're not asking for anything radical. Um, they're asking for the promise of America itself and the United States should be the purveyor of that promise. I'm going to be thinking about your questions here. I'm going to want to follow up on one more theme that you mentioned took very prominently in your remarks, and that was you highlighted the historic nature of the focus of attention shifting in the Arab world to self-determination rather than confrontation with Israel, that you're, you're, you've highlighted all of that. My question to you is, do you think the Arab world now is moving away, is going to rally behind your theme of concentrating on self-determination within individual Arab countries rather than rallying the Arab world around the theme of anti-Israeli policy or anti-American policy vis-a-vis -vis Israel? I don't think that's an accurate dichotomy in terms of the choices we have. I think, uh, uh, if I may uh, suggest a, a, a more comprehensive view, would be that there are levels of priorities for people in the Arab world. Um, for the last 60 years, the public manifestations of political sentiment in the Arab world were predominantly anti-Israeli and anti-British and anti-American because that's what the police state regimes allowed. People were not allowed to say other stuff because they didn't have the freedom and the opportunity. As you get more democratic changes starting to happen, and again, we're in the very early stages, we don't know what's gonna happen, but I think we will make transitions in many and many or most of these countries. As you get more democratic and legitimate governments that genuinely reflect the sentiments of their own people, the sentiments of people across the Arab world are critical of Israel because of Israel's policies towards the Palestinians, predominantly. Um, Egypt, for instance, uh, has a peace treaty with Israel. Egypt is maintaining the uh, terms of that treaty very, very strictly, even though they have a government run by the Muslim Brotherhood. So it's clear that the peace with Israel is meaningful to the Arab countries, but people in the Arab countries are still very upset about how the Palestinians are mistreated by Israel and how they do not have their rights. And therefore, I see a prioritization where Arab countries are trying to get their house in order by having more legitimate democratic governments. And then the issue of Arab-Israeli relations will come onto the agenda. The uprisings that have gone on for the last two years have had nothing to do directly with Arab-Israeli issues. We've had no public statements, virtually nothing about Arab Israel or even about the US or about Europe or about Russia. This is a domestic uprising based on indignities inflicted on citizens by their own societies. This is a domestic uprising. This is a domestic uprising of like Rosa Parks, like Lech Walesa, like Steve Biko, like Aung San Suu Kyi. This is a movement of hundreds of millions of people who refuse to acquiesce in their own dehumanization and their own denial of their rights. And those denials of their rights are done by their own governments. Now they feel things about Israel, about Russia, about the US, but they're not dealing with that now. I think when you get a more democratic system of government and public opinion in the Arab world is critical of Israel, which it is, we know, this will force the Arab governments and the Israeli government to come to terms more diligently, more seriously with the possibilities of peacemaking. Whether it pushes them to actually achieve an ultimate peace that's fair to both sides, or it pushes them both to give up and go back to exploring wars, which I hope doesn't happen, we don't know. Okay, question from, we're gonna do student and non-student. Let's take a question from a student first. Is there a question from a student? Student in the back there, go ahead. I don't think you're a student. I'm gonna, I'm gonna Go to another student here. <laughs> let's, pick a, let's pick a student up here. Go ahead. If the Middle East were to become largely democratic, what role would Islam play? Um, Islam is a very rich and diversified religion. And there are 1.4 billion Muslims around the world. And each one has a different view of the interplay between religion and politics. We're seeing this very, very uh, clearly in Tunisia and, and Egypt today, where for the first time, citizens who are mostly Muslim, though in Egypt you have about eight, nine percent Christians, but 
mostly Muslims are actively debating political systems, democratic systems, mechanisms of pluralism, accountability, transparency. All of these essential elements of democratic governments are being actively debated, including the balance between religiosity and, uh, and secularism. And um, my personal feeling is that the religious, uh, the emphasis on religious sentiment in the last 40 years or so since the 1970s, uh, when you had the latest rise of Islamist sentiment, that has been largely a reaction to the non-democratic -gover non government systems, the corruption, the uh, internal problems, the Arab-Israeli problems, the foreign armies coming at us problems, all these things together. And, and, and with no possibility of people democratically expressing themselves or changing their government's policies, the only outlet people had was to turn to their religion. Very similar to what black people did in the United States in the 1950s and, and 60s. It's why the, the, the civil rights movement was led by preachers. Um, uh, the church was the great organizing uh, place. And, and the gospel was the great uh, um, supporting um, text. Uh, and, and the prophets were the great symbols of hope and change. Uh, for the uh, for the black preachers and some of the white preachers who supported them, uh, so the the role of the church among black people and white people in the civil rights movement in the United States was a very powerful example of how citizens will turn to their religion if it's the last thing that's left to them. And this is, I think, one of the things that's happened. If you look at the Arab countries now, we've had two years since these transitions started, and in some cases, Muslim Brotherhood groups won elections to the presidency, Mohammed Morsi in Egypt. Uh, these guys have acted with, with serious incompetence, uh, great uh, confusion, um, lack, of, uh, uh, lack of ability to really give and take, and they're focused by and large in Tunisia with Rashid Ghanoushi and the Nahda party and in Egypt with the Muslim Brotherhood. They're focused more on maintaining the incumbency of their party than on addressing the needs of all their citizens. And so they've, they've, so far, they might change, so far they've been unable to make the transition from a inwardly focused, religiously defined movement to an expansive national governance structure in which they have been elected democratically. They haven't made that change, which is why people are pushing them very hard now in Egypt and Tunisia, because they haven't delivered. So the, the question of religiosity and Islam is not, is not a long-term uh, question, in, in my view. Uh, the, the, the issue of democratic rights and citizen dignity and equality trumps everything else. If you get democratic systems and citizens feel that they're treated decently by their own governments, the whole Islamist trend will, will, will quiet down. You'll still have a lot of people who talk in, in, in religious terms, but you, you have that here in the United States, people who have prayer breakfast and, um, and, um, and, and use Christian religion especially to uh, drive uh, political uh, organizations. Uh, and it's perfectly normal uh, to do that, but it would, Islam will no longer be the defining public manifestation of people's sentiments or, or where they're going. So I wouldn't put religion as, as the long-term uh, issue. It's really democratic governance and, and the dignity of citizens. Uh, just to follow up on that, we have a question from our audience on Second Life uh, on the internet that really pertains to this question especially. Uh, questioner is asking about Egypt. Do you think that the Islamist Muslim Brotherhood government of Egypt will remain a friend of the United States in the foreseeable future? Or do you think that Egypt is going to turn in a different direction? I don't think we can know that now. It's too early to tell. It will be defined largely by how well the government of Egypt governs, if they govern in a way that responds to the rights and aspirations of its own people. And if people are comfortable with the government and the government does well and it's reelected, that will be one determinant. And the other will be, what is the United States going to do? People react to American policy more than initiate relations with the United States. And we see this in the polling evidence uh, very, very clearly. A majority of people in the Arab world, 
or not a majority, plurality in polls taken across the region, say that Israel and the United States are the, are the greatest, uh, they're, they're, the, the, the parties that they most think are a security threat to them in the Arab world, Israel and the United States. And you, you probably get around 35, 40% across the whole region. It's the number one uh, parties that they point to in public opinion in the Arab world. Uh, and that's because of what they see the U.S. and Israel doing. If, but you go to Libya, and there it's majority of Libyans likes what the United States is doing. So it's very much dependent on what the U.S. does and how uh, effective the government is. If the government is effective, uh, it, it doesn't have to worry too much about the U.S. or Russia. Or, if the government is, is doing badly, it might decide to try to use the U.S. as a scapegoat and try to channel divert people's attention and say, oh, it's all these Americans, it's a conspiracy, we have to unite to fight the... This is what they did in the past. And, and if the U.S. intervenes or involves itself more heavily in, militarily in Syria, will, Arab, the Arab, will that popular opinion change and say, oh, the United States is not a security threat because the United States is sending weapons to Syria? If the United States sends weapons to the Syrian opposition, based on demands by the Syrian opposition, and a, clearly a majority of Syrians wants that, and the Arab League supports it, and I think popular opinion around the Arab world is probably mixed about that. Mm. I think it would probably, like in Libya, Libya you had mixed feelings in the Arab world. I thought the US was okay to do what it did with NATO because of these legitimacy factors I mentioned. Uh, the US didn't initiate this, it responded to a call from the Libyans and the Arab League. Uh, and the Security Council okayed it. So, uh, the, but the public opinion in the Arab world will probably be mixed. I would guess that slightly more would support it than oppose it, okay. but who knows? Question from a non-student. Yes, sir, right here. When Assad begins to use his chemical weapon arsenal, will there be prompt American boots on the ground supported by troops from Jordan, Israel, and NATO? Okay, the question is not if, but when the Syrian regime begins using chemical weapons against its own citizens, will there be prompt U.S. boots on the ground supported by Israel? Who else? Jordan and NATO. Jordan and NATO. Boots on the ground in Syria if Syria uses chemical weapons against its own citizens. If Syria does use chemical weapons, there will be a decisive response. How that response would be done, it's hard to tell. I don't think boots on the ground would, uh, would happen right away, but it's, at some point, if, if some people need to go in and actually physically control some of these weapons, you might need to do that at some point. But it would obviously be preceded by a, a major assault of some sort to get rid of the, uh, of the regime. And I don't think that boots on the ground would be needed to go and, and take care of the weapons. The Syrian opposition groups who are on the ground already would do that. So I would be very, very surprised if there was foreign troops going into Syria but I think a, a significant external military intervention to overthrow the regime quickly and allow the opposition to take control of the weapons would be likely. Question from a student. Yes, sir. The question is, do you ever see Saudi Arabia becoming a democratic country? Um, I, don't, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think that was a silly question. No, no, it's a good yeah. question. Um, I, I see, first of all, I would say that all of the Arab countries, including Saudi Arabia, are subjected to some form of citizen pressure from within for transformations towards more equitable governance, more participatory governance, more democratic governance, more pluralism more rule of law, and different combinations of these things. Saudi Arabia is a very unusual country because of the massive wealth it has. The country is named after a family, the House of Saud. Uh, it's a family named country with massive oil wealth and this strong alliance with the Wahhabi, very conservative religious movement. And, and uh, th there's immense control mechanisms within the country, uh, which lead me to say that there is the inevitability of more pressures within society, which we're starting to see on a very small scale, and for different reasons. Some Shiites complain about being discriminated against and having their men put in jail. Uh, 
some liberal intellectuals complain about not being able to vote enough. Some women complain about not being able to have their full uh, rights in society. But these are very small manifestations right now, but they're starting to happen. And the c continuation of this uh, trend will, will be with us, I think, and will increase to some extent. And therefore, I would expect to see very slow liberalization in Saudi Arabia. I don't see a major change, and certainly not to a full democracy, but certainly moving towards a monarchy that is a bit more consultative, maybe a devolution of power to the governorates where you might have local elected councils, uh, forms of uh, participation, accountability, and governance that reflect, uh, that sh mesh with the traditional emphasis on tribal society organization in Saudi Arabia. It's a very tribal society. Uh, so there will be pressures continuing at a small scale but steady scale, and there will be reactions to that from the government at a very small and steady scale. How about a question from a non-student? Yes, sir. I don't, I'm not sure I understand your question, sir. You're asking whether the U.S. response to Egypt was... No. no. The U.S. response to what? Well, I'm, well, I'm, I'm quoting the very famous Egyptian general. Right. Well, I'm okay, we got that, I think. Yeah, well, What's the question? Okay. Okay, question is... Uh, the question is, as, a, as an Egyptian writer has stated, his opin the Egyptian writer's opinion was that the United States made a policy decision in the case of the Egyptian uprising, and perhaps others, I'll ask you to broaden the question to others, that, that in the Arab world, Islamists should be permitted to come to power as a stabilizing force in the Middle East. What's your view of that? Do you agree with that? I think the United States didn't really have a choice in that. The United States simply came to terms with the reality that the revolutions and uprisings had started to happen. Uh, Islamists had nothing to do with them in the beginning. Even behind the scenes, they were uh, almost non-existent. There were some cases where some young members of Islamist groups like Muslim Brotherhood went to the demonstrations, but they went purely on their own. The, the Islamic groups, the Muslim Brotherhoods, and others told their people to stay away, don't get involved in these uprisings. But many young Islamists went. Uh, but these were predominantly secular, spontaneous uh, uprisings. But then when the elections started to happen, the Islamists who were most organized and had great credit and trust in society won. And therefore, they came into power into incumbency legitimately and democratically. The United States had absolutely no choice in the process. The United States and Israel made a huge mistake when they didn't recognize the victory of uh, Hamas in Palestine and the uh, Islamists in Algeria in 1992 when the Lafis, the Islamic uh, Salvation Front uh, Islamist movement in Algeria won elections in 1992, and the French uh, uh, military and or the, the French presumably and, and Americans and uh, it's, we assume uh, stepped in with the Algerian military to thwart that and not didn't allow the Islamists to take power because they had won. So there was two huge mistakes that the Western world and Israel had made by not coming to terms with democratically elected Islamists in Arab countries, and I think they learned their lesson. So when this, this happened, following a populist revolution, Islamist victories had to be seen as legitimate, and therefore the U.S. Come, came to terms with them. I don't think the U.S. government has the political acumen 
to be able to assess whether Islam is a stabilizing force. I think the United States government, just based on my watching them for the last 40 years, has no idea how to deal with democratic Islamic Arab activism. They, they've, just ne they've never done it before. They've only dealt with Arabs as uh, targets or markets. They're targets to bomb or they're markets to trade with, and that's it. They, they've never dealt with Arabs as people, and, and they've dealt with Arab generals, and that's all. They don't know how to deal with self-determinant, uh, free, proud, assertive, democratic, pluralistic, transparent, accountable Arab men and women. It's a beast that they've never encountered. They have no idea how to deal with it. I think they still don't really know how to come to terms with it, but they're learning, and I think they're doing better now than they did two years ago. The very early reaction of the US and Europe to the Tunisian and Egyptian uprisings, to me, was very troubling. Uh, they were very imprecise. They were humming and hawing. Um, but so it's, it's not, it's, it has nothing to do with the American government deciding that Islam is a, is a stable factor. It's the, it's the will of the people of this region to shape their systems. And the important thing we see in these democratic transitions where they are writing their own constitutions, the real important thing about that is it's showing us for the first time ever, it's showing us what are the issues that matter to people in those societies. So they're debating uh, the role of women, the free press, the role of the military, the central government versus provincial governments. These issues are being discussed finally for the first time ever by ordinary people. And, and Islam is a relatively, it's not a small element, but it's one of many elements that are being discussed. Rami, I'm sorry, I, I, I respect your opinion on that, of course, but uh, it's your critique of the U.S. government for being unable to handle it. I'm curious about your view of the Arab government's ability to handle that kind of revolutionary change. We saw the Egyptians not knowing how to handle it. We saw the Libyan government attempt to completely overthrow it and repress it. We see the Syrian government trying to do the same thing. We see the Bahraini government first saying yes, then saying no. So do you think the Arabs have any better idea how to handle it? No, no, it? absolutely. I think you're talking of apples and oranges. The, these Arab governments were the target of the revolutionary uprisings. The American government is an external observer. They're completely different. But you're right, the Arab governments, by and large, uh, fought back against these uh, changes, rather incompetently in most cases. Uh, and I think uh, uh, in a futile way, that once, you know, there's no power as, uh, as uh, unstoppable uh, as the mass sentiments of a free people. There's no power in the world that can stop that. Um, and, and this is what you're starting to see happen uh, in the Arab countries. And some Arab governments have tried to sort of uh, preempt being overthrown by giving some, uh, giving in, making some reforms, the Jordanian government, the uh, Moroccan government, the, Omani government, others like the Kuwaitis and the Saudis have thrown money at, at their people, which hasn't done anything really to solve it. So clearly the Arab governments um, um, have, uh, I mean, it's not as if uh, they, they don't know how to react to it. They're the problem. Uh, they're the problem that these revolutions are trying to resolve. Question from a student. From a student. Yes, sir. The question is, with the rise of democracy in these movements, will women soon be afforded the same rights as men? I presume you mean in the Arab world. In most of the Arab countries, in virtually all of them, women have the same rights as men, except in a few like in Saudi Arabia where there are strict segregation rules between men and women, where women's free actions are curtailed by, by law and by tradition. In most of the rest of the Arab world, it's not legal constraints that hold back women. It's social conservative traditions, very similar to the condition of women in the United States in 1775, where, where I don't think there was a single woman in the, in the Declaration of Independence or the constitutional debates or anywhere. They were just invisible people. They didn't exist. 
so I think to be fair to our Arab countries, um, we are uh, in a situation where most women in most Arab countries, if they want to be engineers or airplane pilots or judges or members of the cabinet of the government, they can do so, and they do do so. Uh, but in limited numbers, we're still a conservative society where, with the exception of a few countries like Palestine, Lebanon, Tunisia, uh, maybe Morocco and Jordan to a small extent, where the, in most of these countries, uh, women's participation in the labor force is pretty low. It's around 20%, maybe 25%. Because the social traditions uh, expect the woman to stay at home, or, or if she gets an education, maybe teach for a few years, then get married and have kids and stay at home. Uh, but this is fast changing. So I don't think it's a question of the democratic revolutions giving women rights. Most women have almost all of their rights on paper. The, where the women are denied rights is in the same areas where the men are denied rights, which is real democratic uh, accountability, to vote in a truly free election. This is a situation uh, across the Arab region where men and women have both been denied their full human rights for free press, things like that, quality education. And that's one of the reasons that we have these, uh, these uprisings. Rami, because it hasn't been asked yet, and I'm a little surprised that it hasn't, I don't think we could finish a session like this. If it had been held three, four, five weeks ago, uh, the headline topic would have been Iran and its nuclear uh, uh, efforts and so on and so forth. So let me just ask you for your assessment of the state of play with regard to Iran's development of a nuclear program? Is it a weapons program? Is it threatening? If so, to whom? Is it not, if it's not threatening, uh, then is that the reason that it's not in the headlines right now? Do you expect Obama's trip to be uh, you know, swirling around that issue, or dealing with that issue, or is it basically off the agenda at this moment? The, the Iran situation is really important um, because it is not only the technical question of what are they doing with their nuclear enrichment and what are their plans and all that. Uh, but it has two other powerful dimensions that transcend Iran. Uh, one is, I mentioned in my talk, the equal application of international law and safeguards. Uh, if truly Iran should not develop a nuclear weapon, and let's say we all agree with that, then, well, why should Israel be allowed to have a couple hundred nuclear weapons? Or why can't those nuclear weapons in Israel be under the safeguard of uh, the inspection of the International Atomic Energy Agency? So why the distinction between Israel and, and Iran? Um, so the, the application of international legal standards equally across the region is an issue. And the second one is the question of defiance of, of Western powers. The Iranians uh, have defied the West and stood up to the US. Maybe this is suicidal, we don't know, we'll see. But many people look to Iran with admiration because of the way it doesn't buckle, uh, cave in and buckle under to American and European and, and UN threats and sanctions because they feel they're being treated unfairly. The reality, I think, I've been to Iran and I've talked to some of the Iranian nuclear negotiators, I've talked to people on both sides, um, my impression is the Iranians don't want to make a nuclear weapon now, but they want to have the full nuclear enrichment cycle, which they're allowed to do for peaceful purposes. And the, every centrifuge that's spinning in Iran now, I think there's 9,000 of them, every one of them is being watched by UN IAEA inspectors. Everything that they're doing is under United Nations inspection right now. So it's not as if uh, Iran is doing threatening things that are going to create a bomb tomorrow. There are suspicions, there are accusations, there are concerns, there are f new facilities being built that people think might be to do something terrible. Iran is not obligated under any international agreement or treaty or, or law to inform anybody if it digs a hole in a mountain to do something. But the minute it puts centrifuges into a process of enrichment of uranium, they are obligated and they do tell uh, the UN. The other thing I would say is, if you read carefully the Western, especially the American media coverage of Iran, which which I do, painfully as it is, uh, painful as it is, I read it. Every sentence that talks about Iran and its intentions and its weapons and this and that, 
always, and this is our trade as journalists, it's, it's to be good journalists, you have to be accurate. Every sentence is, has something like, Iran is thought to be doing this, or Iran has been accused of doing this, or Iran is expected, maybe planning to do this. There is very, very little, if any, certainty, credible, verifiable certainty in the accusations against Iran. Most of the accusations are based on evidence that the Iranians challenge, computer files and stuff like that. Uh, and, and the Iranians claim that they are responding to all the legal requirements of UN inspection and everything like that. So I'm not saying the Iranians are good guys and the other people are bad guys. I'm saying the Iranians are being treated unfairly according to the existing international legal standards of making sure that uranium enrichment does not lead to production of, of atomic weapons. Uh, the reason that this has, the temperature has lowered a little bit I think is because at the last meeting in Kazakhstan last week, the US and Israel and the West finally blinked because they realized that their th sanctions and their threats and the military stuff is not off the table. And you know, Obama gets up three times at night and says the military option is not off the table. And, and the Iranians say, you know, we don't even know what table you're talking about. We don't care what you're talking about. No, it hasn't worked. The, the sanctions, the threats, the bravado, Netanyahu with his cartoon bombs at the UN, it's failed. And the Iranians have made it clear that they're not going to buckle under. They say because they're not producing nuclear weapons. I don't know if they're producing nuclear weapons or not. Uh, but I think the West and the Israel finally got the, got the message that there has to be a better way to deal with this. And I think what's starting to happen at Kazakhstan, and they're meeting again this week for technical talks, is the West is talking to the Iranians in a way that recognizes what I mentioned in my opening sentence in my talk tonight. We have to look at US Middle Eastern relations as the rights of both sides to be applied simultaneously and with equal magnitude. And I think this is starting to happen. The people are, are, are the, so the talks are starting to talk about some of the sanctions will be reduced if the Iranians reduce some of their stockpiles of 15% uh, enriched or 18% or 5% or all these different technical things. So there's starting to be a situation where they're negotiating mutual steps to get to the point that they all want to get to, which is Iran can enrich, nuclear, enrich uranium for nuclear, for peaceful purposes. And the rest of the world is guarantee, has safeguards that none of this enriched uranium is going to be uh, moved off secretly to make nuclear bombs, which is a perfectly legitimate goal. So I think we're, there's some progress in that uh, process. And, and the progress is there because finally, the West started to, instead of threatening and sanctioning, they started to make tangible offers to the Iranians related to reducing the sanctions, and the Iranians are, are making uh, simultaneous offers to uh, move, uh, to uh, uh, change what they're doing with some of their stockpiles of enriched uranium and other things. And this is something that's very positive, and both sides should be encouraged. Okay, heard your uh, comments about equal treatment under the law and so on and so forth. Snarky last question. Choose any Arab leader, make yourself any Arab leader, with exception of Bashar Assad, okay? And tell me whether you, as that Arab leader, would prefer to rely on the handling of a nuclear program by the Israeli government or the handling of a nuclear program by the Mahmoud Ahmadinejad government? You pick the, you pick the Arab country and then say, which one would you trust more on the handling of the nuclear program? Snarky I, question. I don't, you can make it a snarky I answer. don't accept the validity of your question. Okay. <laughs> That's a good dodge. We'll leave it at that. I think the, 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 the sentiment behind the question is valid, but I think the, uh, it's apples and oranges. I okay. think both sides must be addressed with the same moral and legal safeguards. Okay. Now let's please thank our speaker tonight, Rami Khoury. Good evening, everyone.